Welcome to another analysis of one of the 20 CSEC English B poems. This week, we'll take a look at the poem, It is the Constant Image of Your Face by Dennis Brutus. In it, the personer feels that he must repress his love for a particular woman or even another country if he is to be loyal to his mother country. So without further ado, let's begin by reading the poem. It is the Constant Image of Your Face by Dennis Brutus. It is the constant image of your face framed in my hands as you knelt before my chair. The grave attention of your eyes surveying me amid my world of knives that stays with me, perennially accuses and convicts me of heart's treachery. And neither you nor I can plead excuses, for you, you know, can claim no loyalty. My land takes precedence of all my loves. Yet I beg mitigation, pleading guilty for you, my dear accomplice of my heart made without words, such blackmail with your beauty, and proffer me such dear protectiveness that I confess without remorse or shame, my still fresh treason to my country. And I hope that she, my other dearest love, will pardon freely, not attaching blame being your mistress or your match in tenderness. Let me share some quick facts about the poet of this poem. The poet name is Dennis Brutus. He was a South African educator, journalist, activist, and poet. Brutus was known for his campaign against the apartheid government in South Africa. So apartheid was a system of institutionalized racial segregation that existed in South Africa and Southwest Africa from 1948 to the early 1990s. So people of color could not vote, own land, live where they wanted, move freely about the country, or send their children to a decent school. In fact, education only prepared children to serve white people or the white economy. So people of color could only work in the mines, on farms, in factories, or as domestic servants. As a result, Brutus sought to have apartheid South Africa banned from the Olympic Games. This led to him being persecuted and imprisoned by the apartheid government in a cell next to Nelson Mandela for 18 months. After he was released in 1965, he left South Africa on an exit permit, which meant he could never return home while the apartheid government remained in power. So Brutus went into exile in Britain and then in the United States. While there, Brutus worked as a professor of American and African literature at various universities. And over the years, he wrote a collection of poems depicting his prison experience, his unwavering hope for freedom and a peaceful resolution in apartheid South Africa. Brutus eventually returned to South Africa at the end of the apartheid regime and remained in teaching and social justice issues until his death. Let's take a quick look at literary lenses. Literary lenses are the vehicles for all literary analysis, and they are often referred to how we read or analyze a work of literature from a specific or different perspectives. It is often likened to a pair of glasses that influence how we view or look at something. This can be done from a historical, biographical, sociological, intellectual, or even a cultural context among many others. So whatever perspective or literary lens we decide to use to analyze a work of literature or even a piece of literature, it must be noted that none is more right than the other. Let me repeat, none is more right than the other. Accordingly, an examination of the life experiences of our poet, Dennis Butus, will help us to improve our analysis of today's poem. Nevertheless, we will come to see that this poem is not limited to just one literary lens, that is, this poem can be analyzed on both a figurative and a literal level, however, its author's intention. These are two lenses for our analysis. One, the person is torn between his love for his motherland and a woman, and or the person is torn between his love for his motherland and another country. As mentioned in the previous slide, the person in this poem is torn between two loves, his love for a woman and his love for his homeland, or his love for his homeland and his love for another country. 
So remember in literature, we are not limited to one construct or literary lens. As long as we can find the textual evidence to support our analysis, our conclusion is valid. So in order to discuss the context of the personas two loves, we must examine why and how the personas homeland and another country or countries on a whole are always referred to as sheep or ho. So there are two reasons. Firstly, female pronouns are used for countries in times of war. And evidently, the person is at war with himself, his homeland, a woman, and or another country. Thus, the use of female pronouns is based on the fact that most people are always on the lookout to protect the dignity and pride of their homeland. Therefore, they see their country as a woman whose dignity and pride must be protected and safeguarded. This reminded me of when I was studying in a particular country <laughs> many years ago. I was talking to a citizen there and she's like, oh, I went to your country and it was boring. I was like, say what? Where did you stay? Who did you go with? What did you do? What did you see? And I proceeded uh, to tell her about the different venues, the different sites and the different things that one can experience while in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So I could understand this particular point about always looking out for the dignity and pride of your country. Now, secondly, one can trace the history between countries based on gender in the English language to Latin because English should do not, English doesn't um, genderize their, their nouns unlike languages like Spanish, okay? However, apart from French, Latin is one of those languages that greatly influence the English language. And of course, this language has masculine and feminine nouns, for example, the word terraformer, which means odd or strong odd, is feminine. So because of this feminine reference in Latin, and because the earth is actually seen as fertile, which is a rich source of food and nurture for all living things, we refer to our planets as mother earth rather than father or any neutral pronoun. Let's take a look at the structure of the poem. The poem has two stanzas. In stanza one, the person blames the woman or the other country for feeling that he is betraying his motherland, insisting that his loyalty is first and foremost to his country. In stanza two, the person admits his ongoing treason as a victim of conspiracy between his refugee country and another country and or a woman. These two stanzas have nine lines each with 10 syllables that have five pairs of stressed and unstressed syllables, which fits the pattern of an iambic pentameter. There are a number of near rhymes that do not have clear patterns. However, there is one example of true rhyme in words such as blame and shame in line 14 and line 17. Let's comment on the title of the poem. The title is called, It is the Constant Image of Your Face. One of the rules in capitalization instructs that we should always capitalize the first letter of every important word in a title. So when we look at this title, we are seeing that the I in it, the C in constant, the I in image, the Y in your, and the F in face are all capitalized. So we know that we are supposed to pay close attention to those words to see the clues that are in them to help our understanding of the poem or even to prepare us for the content of the poem. So the word constant there means occurring continuously over a period of time. So something is happening in this poem that is reoccurring with even without interruptions. When we consider the word image there, image can be seen as a visual representation of something, okay? However, when we move to the word face, we have to consider it in three different ways because we have different lenses or interpretation of the poem. Okay, so one, it can be seen as a body part and in that the body part of a woman, for example. So when we consider the face of a woman, that is the front part of the woman's head from the forehead to the chin. Face can also be seen as a country because we are saying that the person is also in love. Can, it be, can be interpreted that the person has love for another country. Okay, so in this case, face can be perceived as um, the portraits of that nation, right? The nature or character of the, its organization, industry, system, and even the way it appears to people, the general appearance of a particular place. Okay, so in this case, where a country is concerned, what can be haunting the persona is, for, for example, its beauty, um, the different images that reminds the persona of that place. 
So when we think about the Statue of Liberty in New York, New York will come, will come to the persona's mind. When we think about um, Buckingham Palace, England will come to the persona's mind. So that's what we mean by image, those portraits of a country or a nation. Also, it can be seen as the persona's dilemma because face can also be um, the persona's inability to confront and deal with or accept a difficult or pleasant task, fact, or situation. And we know that the persona is torn between his love for his homeland and his love for a woman, or the person is torn between his love for his homeland or his love for another country. So depending on our love interest or whatever love interest we prefer or adopt in this poem, note that image there is quite ambiguous as well as the word face. Let's begin with stanza one. Stanza one begins, it is the constant image of your face. Right away, we see that the title of the poem is repeated in the first line of stanza one. So right away as well, we know that this is an example of repetition, which is a literary device. Usually when repetition is used, it is used because the poet or the persona wants to highlight a particular idea or concept, wants us to really zero in and focus on a particular word, right? So in this case, Repetition, it is the constant image of your face, highlights the memory of the faithful lover's face. Whether this faithful lover is a woman or another country that is not the persona's mother country. Okay. Also, the first line is, a, is an example of visual imagery because we can visualize a face just occurring over, perpetually over and over to the persona. Okay. And it's there highlighted in green as well. Now, faces can be face there is an example of metaphor remember we said that because we are saying that this poem can be interpreted on a literal level and even on a figurative level where we take into consideration the poet's life because of that face can be seen as a body part a country or even the persona's dilemma so and as it relates to the body part it can be the actual woman's face that constant image the recurring picture of a face which is the frontal part of a person's head from the forehead to the chin face there can also be used as a metaphor for country remember we did our discussion about the feminization of countries as mother and she and her okay so in this case it's basically the portrait of a country or nation that's what face means where country is concerned the nature or the character of its organization industry system and even the way it appears to people the general appearance of its particular place okay and also i'm saying that face can also highlight the persona's dilemma Right, so the persona's dilemma or inability to confront and deal with or accept the difficult or pleasant situation at hand. Because we will get to see that the person is actually torn or conflicted between two loves, okay? So it is the constant image of your face framed in my hands as you knelt before my chair. So notice the use of the word framed in my hand or the words framed in my hands as you knelt before my chair. That entire line is also an example of visual imagery because one, it appeals to a sense of sight and we can therefore visualize a woman there kneeling before the persona as he sits in a chair. Also the word frame, framed calls to mind that poem called Salt by Camry Bratwit where the person is recapturing a memory. In this case, frame there is a picture. It tells us that the, picture, the persona has a picture in his mind that is reoccurring over and over again. Okay, and it also calls to mind uh, the, the image of a photograph in a photo frame as well. So framed in my hands as you knelt before my chair, notice the use of the word you there. Okay, so in this case, um, you there will be, uh, you, expect, you will expect the person to use you if we are focusing on the, the interpretation or analysis of the person not being in love with a woman. But it, it, it becomes personification when the persona refers to you as that other country that is not his home country. Okay, if we remember in our about the poet slide, we learned that the persona was exiled from South Africa by the apartheid government. And after having served 18 months in prison in a cell next to Nelson Mandela, he was then exiled to England as well. 
okay so he was exiled to england and then he later went on to the united kingdom and because of our discussion on the feminization of countries and so on because of that we see how that you here becomes a personification and remember personification is the use of inanimate objects to the use of sorry human qualities to describe inanimate objects okay so in this case by referring to you there to um by using the word you to refer to a country is an example of personification and it basically depicts the woman's or the other country's inability to accept the persona's dilemma okay as we will see later on in line two and three and even four and five okay so line three the person says the grave attention of your eyes notice the use of the word grave to describe the type of attention that is being depicted on the woman or from the country's eyes okay the word grave there means serious or even very bad so it's a grave attention of your eyes so if we consider the case where we are saying that okay we use a literal interpretation of a woman why is it that the woman is watching the persona so attentive and in a serious manner and even when he looks at her eyes, it's as if the, at the look of the eyes are uh, making him feeling guilty, as if he really did something, okay? But when we even consider it as it relates to a country, what might the persona have done to that country that will actually want them to watch him with seriousness? Okay, so let's read on. But we also said that eyes there can be seen as personification only as it relates to the country, right? The country eyes on the persona. But let's read on. It says that the grave attention of your eyes surveying me amid my world of knives. Now, the word surveying is actually the work of examining and reporting on the general condition of an area, or even features as well. Okay. Also, when we use the word surveying, it can seem as though the person is constantly monitored by somebody. Okay. So it seems as it relates to the woman that she's constantly looking at him maybe to see what he will do. You know, she's following his very, every action. She's waiting on him to make a decision, maybe even in a case to probably uh, appease her as well. As it relates to the person, to the another country, that is not the persona's home country. So in, for example, if we peep into the poet's life when he was living in England and even the United States, because they are the ones who on him, who protected him, who fed him, who provided a job for him and even shelter when he was exiled from South Africa, one can really say that they had a good reason to survey him, whether they figured that, um, you know, really and truly, maybe he was a spy for the government, which is not likely because we know that he was anti-apartheid. He did not support the government that was in South Africa at that time. But notice that the persona, it seems as though the persona didn't feel safe for a reason. Right, because he felt as if he's being constantly surveyed by this other country. So just as the woman is in affected, the, the persona's country, which behaves like a mystic. And when I say country, the persona's second country. So in this case, England or the USA can be seen as surveying him. Right. But we will see why all of a sudden the person will feel his eyes on him and you know he's constantly being surveyed or even monitored. So the grave attention of your eyes surveying me amid my wall of knives. So my wall of knives is an example of a metaphor, right? Now we know that knives are used to cut food and even used to kill animals for food and so on. And it's often when it is used, if it's, in, it's used to inflict pain, it's a case where one, you are killed or you are stabbed in the back or it's used against you in one way or the other, right? But the person says that his world is filled of knives. It, knives. it tells us that the person doesn't feel safe at all. So it's one thing that the eyes that are looking at him are very attentive. He feels as if he is being constantly surveyed and also the wall of knives, right? It seems as though he has to constantly watch his back wherever he is at that time. And it is said that the metaphor of wall of knives, um, it, causes the per it basically tells us about the cause of the persona's internal and external conflict between his two loves right and it will see that it's and the danger that looks in his mother country or his environment so maybe it's a case when in terms of wall and knives why is it that somebody might even want to attack the persona with knives right and i spoke to you a bit earlier about the fact that he was taken in by england and america and so on and we will later learn that the persona eventually 
after the end of the apartheid government in South Africa, left everything behind and went back to South Africa. Even when he was living in England and the USA, he had a, what we call a healthy job. He was even a professor of African and was it African and American literature as well, right? And he just left in a snap and went back home as if he didn't remember the betrayal and, and even the imprisonment and the persecution he endured in South Africa, which led to his exile in England and the USA. However, let's read on. So the persona in the next line says that this, this grave attention, this sovereign amid my wall of knives, it stays with me. Okay, it stays with me, it doesn't move. Because remember, this reiterate the idea of that constant image, the word constant, which means that it's perpetual and it's being done without interruption. Okay, so it stays with me, perennially accuses and convicts me of heart treachery. Now, the word perennially actually means that it, it's constantly happening in this case. So it's occurring in a way that lasts a very long time and it is happening repeatedly. So the person is being accused repeatedly for something or the other. So in the case of the woman, she's accusing him because he has betrayed her. He has broken her heart. And it seems as though the, she doesn't feel or she's not receiving what she things that she deserves in this case, okay? And even when we consider the case of another country, which is England and maybe the USA, it can be seen as a case where they, they feel as if they were betrayed because they were hoping after they would have cautioned him, they would have sheltered him, fed him and so on, that, you know, he will remain where he was with them. But we later on learn that he went back to South Africa. So perennially accuses and convicts me of heart treachery. Now, you could imagine being in a relationship with somebody and whatever happened between the both of you, you would have trashed it out and then said, you know what, we'll move on from here. But in every second and every moment, every time you remember, you are continuously accusing the person, reminding the person and convicting the person of the betrayal that they did to you. Okay, so basically this is what is happening in this line. Notice that besides perennially accusing the persona, it convicts me of harsh treachery. Usually when somebody is convicted, um, it's basically declared by someone to be guilty of a criminal offense. So the woman or that other country, which we are saying can be those countries that shelter the persona, they are accusing the person of heart treachery or betrayal, okay? Now, convicts me and perpetually accuses me even before I move on to heart treachery. These are all examples of personification there in pink as well, okay? So it is a case where the eyes are doing the accusation and the conviction, okay? So... And we said that the personification depicts the woman's or the other country's inability to accept the persona's dilemma. Now we have an example of an oxymoron in heart treachery. And we know that an oxymoron is put in two contrasting ideas together and often highlights the strangeness of the time or the conflict that the, the person is en en enduring or experiencing in that moment. Because in this case, heart treachery, heart is often associated with love and, and compassion, yet it is being joined towards such as treachery, which means betrayal. But the use of heart treachery there, or the use of this oxymoron, basically highlights the heartbreak and the betrayal felt by the woman or the other country, okay, because of the person's decision or the, 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 because the person is so conflicted that he cannot choose them or he did not choose them. And line stands the one goes on and it says, and neither you nor I can plead excuses because at the end of the day, as much as I am guilty, right, as much as I am guilty, we cannot plead excuses for ourselves, even you. The person went on and says, and even before I go on, notice you there, of course, it's an example of personification because we have to account for the person speaking to another country. And of course, it's um, repetition. Notice the use of you, you, you in this particular stanza. It, it continues to remind us that there's an audience and the person sees the country as a person because the person deeply loves this country. Okay, he has a deep love for his country, just as not for his mother country and this country as well, because after all, they love him, they protected him, they, they took him in when he wasn't even wanted by his own country. So that's why we will continuously see pronouns such as you to remind us and to give that feeling of that country as if it's, it's feminine as well. Okay, so the second to last line says, for you, you know, can claim no loyalty. And of course, 
you is repeated there and we have the same essence of it being a personification it's being repeated there it's being highlighted for just to remind us about the personal love for this country deep love for this country as well but i want to also bring to our attention the use of what we call parenthetical commas okay and they are uh, they are uh, before the word the you in you know and at the end of no there right so what are par parenthetical commas they are are usually give additional information they are to a sentence right so they behave the same way as parentheses or brackets the information between these two commas may be considered additional and moving it should not really affect the essence or the meaning of a sentence such information can be added for extra details or commentary but in this case if we will read it with, by beginning with the line above it and neither you nor i can plead excuses for you you know can claim no loyalty so the person is speaking to you and then he adds you know it gives us the impression that the woman or even the the other country which is not the person's home country the, they the she is aware that he cannot give her what she's asking for you are aware of this this is something this is not something new okay so for so you you know can claim no loyalty you cannot actually claim um, a strong feeling of support or allegiance or faithfulness that is steadfast in the face of temptation. You can claim that from me because you're aware, even before that, I cannot give that to you. However, the second to last line there ends with a dash, the use of a dash there. And usually when a dash is used, it can be used for different things to show interruption of thoughts and so on. But in this case, it clarifies who the person or claims to love the most. Okay, it actually come the, the, it basically gives us a little interruption, but it basically to introduce so we can really lead on to that. So the last line of stanza one says, my land takes precedence of all my love. Okay, so it tells us that this is basically why the, con the person is so conflicted because number one, he cannot remain if we are thinking about his love in terms of another country, in the case of the USA and even England, he cannot give them that false love he has for his mother country. That's why at the end of the apartheid regime in South Africa, he, in 1990, he went back when you know persons might have expected that you know after having a uh, being a professor and you know living the, the life that he was living there being exposed to their culture their food and all that they off they offered him that might have enticed him to even settle there permanently that was not the case he packed his bags and he went straight back to um, south africa forgetting the persecution even the imprisonment he would have faced and even endured there Okay, so my land takes precedence. The word precedence there means, well, first and foremost, it is the condition of being considered more important or more value than someone or something else. It shows priority in importance, order, or rank. So my land takes precedence of all my loves. I miss the different loves and so on. My land takes precedence of all. So because of this, this is what's calling, causing all the conflict and the, why the person is torn between his love for his home, his home country and his love for a woman or another country in this, in this sense, okay? So at number nine on my right, on the poetic devices, I also have some words you can use for diction, which are constant, framed, knelt, grave, attention, and the others as well and feel free to add any more as long as you can discuss using textual examples or evidence how they aided your understanding of the poem as well so let's move on to stanza two stanza two begins yet i beg mitigation pleading guilty for you my dear accomplice of my heart notice line one of stanza two begins with the word yet yet means still or even no or even but at the same time so why is it that the person is saying but at the same time i beg mitigation the word mitigation there means it's actually the act of reducing the severity or seriousness or even painfulness of something what is the person reducing in this case the person is reducing the fact that he just told the woman or the other country that cared for him that i cannot love you the way in which you want me to love you because my land takes precedence of all my love this is something you knew before however after hurting the other country or the woman the person still has the heart to say yet i beg mitigation 
But at the same time, I ask to reduce the seriousness of something or even the painfulness of something. Notice that the person went on and plead guilty, pleading guilty for you, my dear accomplice of my heart. So in this case, uh, the person pleads for mercy, a reduction in the seriousness of the offense, although admitting his guilt. He went on and he says, for you, my dear. Notice that my dear is also enclosed in uh, par parenthetical commas. And they notice that he's using these soft, passionate words that shows that he holds the country or the woman to his heart. Okay, because words such as in these end words of endearment are used. So for you, my dear, accomplice of my heart, made without words, such blackmail with your beauty. So for you, my dear, I said that it's an example of parenthetical um, comments where it was that add information to the, the sentence are used. But in this case, usually when they're used, you can, um, it's either they add to the statement or even when you remove them, they should not change the sense or the meaning of the sentence in this case. But words like, adding words like my dear and so on, basically tells you that the person feels deeply for the woman and the other country that is not his mother country, okay? So for you, my dear, accomplice of my hand. Notice the use of the word accomplice there. Accomplice means it's actually a person who helps another commit a crime. So he's saying at the end of the day that I am also, I'm guilty, but you are guilty as well because you assisted me in committing this crime. Now, we don't know what that crime is, uh, where the, the, the particular crime is, where the woman and the person is concerned. However, for him to call her an accomplice meant or even means that she partake in some criminal, criminal activity that involved the person or she assisted in one way or the other. However, as relates to the country, that uh, when we actually use the poet's um, life experiences, accomplice could be, for example, accomplice of my heart, not just accomplice, right? But if the, the country could become an accomplice if they actually allowed him, in the case of Dennis Brutus, while he was living there, while they sheltered him and so on, they offered him a job, he taught as a professor, and he was able to write about his experience in um, uh, in the apartheid government in South America. He was able to write books, and he continued to actually rebuke the government in South Africa. South America at the time for the way in which they were running the country. Okay, so at the end of the day, and they, of course, they offer different things that kept the person there as well, right? So the person described that love action as an accomplice of my heart made. Notice that the whatever crime was committed, the crime was committed with the person's heart. And of course, this is an example of personification because it is the, it is the person's um, sense of safety in this case. So, it person vacation, the accomplice of my heart, it tells it gives the impression that the heart can actually um join with um different things as it relates to this poem, as it relates to keeping the person in the country or even keeping the person as tied or a torn between his home country and the woman or the woman or the another or the other country. Right, but the case is that the person actually says that you are an accomplice. You actually made plans with my heart to have me here in this internal, even external conflict that I'm faced with as well. So they made without words, words were not used, but the person said that they blackmail me with your beauty. Such blackmail with your beauty. So beauty there is an example of visual imagery because you know. Uh, it appears to a sense of size and immediately we start thinking about or even visualizing beautiful things. So in the case of the country, such as England, America, where the poet live, lived, it can be the different size, the different things that are not found physically in the persona's country. Beauty can also not just be those physical things that you can touch, but beauty for the person could mean the, the, the freedom of speech, the freedom to demonstrate and not be arrested or even treated. In fact, when we think about what transpired in South Africa under the apartheid government, remember that colored persons were not able to work certain jobs. Their children couldn't afford decent education. They were not allowed to just walk across the country how they feel like and when they feel like. And the fact that where the person or where the, not the person, or sorry, where the poet was living, if we actually use the biographical approach, we will learn that to the person, or this is beauty. You know, my freedom is, is beauty, my conscience, my freedom of conscience, and also freedom to do as I choose for me. 
that can be seen as beauty as well, as long as with the different infrastructures and so on that existed there that were not in South America. So I'm saying that you will use that anal analysis if you are um, using the interpretation of the persona being in love with another country as well as his home country as well, okay? And of course, beauty can be, if we are taking the woman into consideration and saying that we are exploring that literal analysis, that literal interpretation that the person is in love with a woman, right? Well, then of course, we hope beauty will be of physical features as well, okay? So the person says that I'm made without words, and I said that this can also be an example of even auditory imagery because of course you can hear deafness, you can hear when a song is made. So it's made without words and the blackmail with your beauty. The word blackmail there means is actually a criminal offense of demanding payment or another benefit from someone in return for some for revealing, in return for not revealing, compromising or damaging information about them. That's how you blackmail somebody. So the person is saying at the end of the day, you use your beauty to keep me where I am, to keep me where I am at this time. Okay. So the person went on and he said, and proffer me such their protectiveness. The word proffer there means to put forward something to someone to accept. Okay. But even before, even before we get there, note that we are saying that the word proffer means to put forward something to someone to accept. What exactly, where the woman is concerned, we, we, we can't help but ask ourselves where the woman is concerned, what did she offer him? Did she offer him money, for example? Did she offer him probably children? Did she offer him, you know, different things to have him there? But as we read on, we learn that the, she actually put forward and she offered the persona such their protectiveness in her arms, in her presence, staying with her, meant that the persona would have been protected. And even when we consider the fact that the persona um, love interest is actually another country, we can see why the persona can be enticed or would have been enticed with places like England and even the USA, where he had to, you know, live because he was exiled from South Africa. He could not have lived in South Africa there on because obviously the government and persons who are for the government would have sought to kill him. Okay, so we can understand why um, the, the woman or even that other country offered him their protectiveness and this was enticing to the persona. But also the persona went on and he says that, that I confess without remorse or shame. Notice the word confess is used there. When somebody confess, they admit that one has committed a crime or done something wrong. So the person has said that without words, you blackmail me with your beauty and proffer me such their protectiveness that I confess without remorse or shame. So because of your beauty and the strength of your blackmail, I actually admitted that I was wrong and I did it without remorse or shame. I was not ashamed to say that. You know, because I was so captivated by your beauty. Okay. So in this case, um, confess the word confess can, I said, can be auditory imagery. And because we can hear the persona's guilt, okay, by the use of the word confess as well. But for th those um, one, two, three, four lines of stanza two, know that the persona really explains that she, the woman, whether it's a woman or the other country, has gang up with his heart and used her beauty to blackmail him and made him feel so loved and safe that he admits without any regrets that he has been and continues to be unfaithful to his country. And he said it with not just without regret, but without remorse or any shame whatsoever. So the next line says that the person says that my still fresh trees into my country. This is what he confessed. He said that he's still experiencing his treason for his country as if it happened yesterday, as if it happened few mo few moments ago, right? And notice when something is fresh, it describes something as new or having its original strength and vigor and quality as well. So the person said that I still feel as if I committed treason against my country yesterday. And we know that treason is a crime of betraying one's country or assisting its enemies in war. So it means that that woman is the country's enemy for some reason or the other. And it also reminds me of when um, persons like in the army go missing, they say that they go AWOL, right? And whenever you are caught or captured, 
you have to spend some time, right? And I guess anybody who encourages somebody to do something like that is an enemy of the state as well, okay? So for some reason, he chose the woman. And then the person seemed to be very conflicted. He said, in stanza one, that my land is precedent of all my love. But what we're hearing here is the person is coming back and saying that after you blackmail me with your beauty, and of course, by saying you blackmail me with your beauty, the person is projecting, of course, okay? So anyhow, he says that you blackmail me with your beauty and offer me such their protectiveness that I confess without remorse or shame my still fresh treason to my country. Okay? And I hope, and but even before I go there, my still fresh treason to my country. The person that seemed to be choosing this woman, you know, by saying I beg mitigation, I met I beg to reduce the pain I would have caused you to feel and so on. And then he's still saying that I confess without remorse or shame, right? For his still fresh treason for my country. Really and truly, the person seems as though he hasn't really made a decision between these two loves, right? Anyhow, he went on. I noticed the use of the word, the repetition of um, the, the pronoun my, right? And I have here that it basically highlights the person's attachment to his two loves, whether it's his love for the woman or his love for his for the other country, which can be seen as the United States or England, right? But the person, by the use of these my and, and even the, his country in himself, his mother country, you know, he's basically claiming ownership, even though he would have left if we are reading into the person, the poet, sorry, biographical, um, we're using the bi biographical account, notice the use of um, such thick words like my, which tells us that even though he was exiled and he would have traveled to the, Uni to the United States and England, it, it, South Africa still and will always be his home at the end of the day, okay? Let's move on. And the person says, and I hope that she, my other dearest love, Right, notice the use of the pronoun she there, and I hope that she, my other dearest love, will pardon freely. So remember, we discussed the feminization of countries and the use of words like mother earth and she and her, and so to describe um, the land or the earth or countries in general. Notice that we also have an example again of parenthetical commas enclosed there, just to give additional information or even clarity. So the person who wanted us to know who this she is. Okay, and the she here is basically referring to the person as mother country, right? So, literal, if we're even taking the woman into consideration, even if we use the biographical account of the poet's life, know that she here, or my other, other love, or my dearest love, is really South Africa. Usually when we use words such as dearest, it means our most loved or cherished, and it is used as an um, affectionate form of address. And it's also a term used when writing to someone you love, right? So, of course, that parenthetical comma, or commas were not used in vain. The person who wants us to know that um, even though we know that he sounds conflicted, he's still going back and forth. And he said that she, my, my other dearest love, will pardon freely. Okay? And also notice that he said that she, my other dearest love. It suggests that really and truly the woman... Or the other country seem to be dearest love as well you know as if because when if, if you read it in terms of she my other right dear love well then you know at least we know that there's a lesser degree of love somewhere but she my other and dearest love maybe if a comma was there after love you know that was her fixed that and so on but it can be read in that light as well however i hope and also the use of the I, 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 you know, the person is just stating what he wants. I hope that she, my other dearest love, will pardon freely, not attaching blame. So the, this is very important. Those two, these two lines, last lines of the poem, they are very important because notice that he's saying that I hope that she will not attach blame. So the person who hopes that his other love, which is his, his mother country, will excuse him, not holding him responsible. Okay, he's hoping that, I mean, she will excuse him, she will not blame him, she'll turn a blind eye to the decision he is making or has made to stay with this woman or to love another country instead, right? So I hope that she, my other dearest love, will pardon freely, not attaching blame, blame being your mistress or your match in tenderness, okay? Now we are at the last two lines of stanza two. The person, the person says that, I will pardon freely, not attaching blame. That's an example of personification. If we are 
following the line of the persona being in love with his mother country and another country right that is the, for the biographical approach where we are using the, per, the poet's life to shed light on this poem we can think about where the persona was sent after exile well, well where he was sent to be in exile which is england and the united states okay so um will pardon me freely not attaching blame in this case the person is saying even though he said earlier that my land my mother country takes precedence he said that you know i confess even with remorse or with all shame that i still feel the treason and so on in my heart but at the end of the day i hope she i hope she uh, agrees to not deal with me hardly or see me in a bad light okay but i hope she will pardon me freely and she will not apply, attach blame Notice the last line of stanza two says that being your mistress, your there's basically the, the woman or the other country. And notice the use of the word mistress as well. Now the word mistress, uh, the, the connotation has changed a lot over time. Some years ago, it meant, um, well, one, it can be seen as a woman in position of authority, which was the case years ago. And then um, centuries ago as well, two decades ago, it was even used to describe a woman who operates or even owns a, a brothel, right, or a prostitute house, right? And it can also be seen as a woman other than a man's wife having a sexual relationship with a married man or someone who's called a lover as well. So notice that he's saying that I hope that my country will not will pardon me freely, not attaching blame, being your mistress, your mistress there, and the your is referring to the woman or the other country right being your mistress so it makes me wonder how is the person who using the word mistress in this case what connotation is being used because you expect the woman or the other country to be the the mistress because they are like the side woman they are not the main love because the person already established that my land takes precedence so if it's anything the woman on the and the other country should be referred to as mistress but the person says that I hope that she will pardon you, not attaching blame, being your mistress or your match. Your match there means being your equal in tenderness, right? Why is it that you can say that your land takes precedence, that you value your land more, your land, your home country takes priority and order and rank and so on, yet there seems to be some contradiction in the last line here because the person is now saying that, you know, being your mistress, unless mistress is used as the woman in the position of authority. I have two of them and at the end of the day she's the one to the top if we look at mistress in terms of somebody who's just a lover or someone who sleeps with somebody who's married in this case the person is married already to his home country and he has this side woman which is the, the, the side woman in the form of a woman or in the form of another country whom he loves um very 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 deeply okay but being your mistress it seems like the, the appropriate interpretation here or maybe the intention is to use mistress as it relates to the woman in authority, the one that ranks out every other loves in the persona's life, right? So being your mistress or your match in tenderness. Now the word tenderness means gentleness or even kindness or even sensitivity to pain or even soreness in this case, right? So since the country is the persona's um, love teacher or perhaps just or equal in the art of loving care. So the person is very conflicted you know it seems as though on one side he's saying that you know you i can claim both of us we can claim loyalty or you can ask me to be loyal to you because you are well aware that i cannot give that to you i've told you before i'm telling you again that my land takes precedence yet at the beginning of stanza two it begins yet i beg mitigation yet amidst everything you know i wanted to reduce the hurt and the pain and he calls the, the woman or the other country my dear and how you black me with beauty to the extent that you know i confess even what i did to my country without remorse or shame and so on right lovely poem so we have there the um some example of diction please feel free to add any other words you can think about and let me just reiterate if you're asked for a poetic device, you must know the difference between poetic device and figurative devices for CXC. The poetic device, once they ask for that, is anything whatsoever. Right? And of course, diction is an example of um, poetic device. You have to state diction to get the mark. You give an example of a word in the poem, you give the definition, and then you discuss how it would have aided your understanding of the poem.
So here are some tones in the poem which speaks to the persona's attitude towards the subject. So there's example of guilt where the persona, if we take the biographical approach where we use slip, snippets or clues of the, the life of Dennis Brutus, we see examples of guilt where the person says that uh, it's the constant image of your face framed in my hands. You know, the person's feel really guilty for something, right? Even when the person says that I, con I confess without remorse or shame there, that's an admission of guilt, right? We have examples of um, that the person is conflicted. On one hand, he's saying at the end of the day, my land takes precedence of all my love. But at the end of stanza two, we are hearing the, pe we are hearing the person say, that um, at the end of the day, she is your mistress, right? Or you're each other's mistress or equal in much of tenderness, right? Then we said that the word tenderness can mean gentleness. So he's basically comparing his love or the tenderness received from his home country and a woman and or another country. So in the case of the poet's life, the tenderness could, have be, could be seen in terms of the things that he received when he went into exile in England and in the US as well. Okay, and tenderness can be the case that, you know, at the end of the day, South Africa is, is his home, family members are there, it will always be his first love. This is where he he, fe he feels more comfortable outside of the apartheid regime. That's why when the that regime of government ended, he immediately returned in 1992, South Africa. And of course, there's example of sadness there. The person uh, um, feels sad that he's not able to, you know, um, give this woman what she wanted, okay, to the extent that he feels as if um, he has betrayed his country, you know, for her, and even not just his country, he feels as if he, you know, he has betrayed that the, the other country, if we are thinking about the poet's life, where they would have, you know, sheltered him and fed him and protected him in his most vulnerable times as well, right, and the, the the idea of him returning or not giving him that loyalty, which they really deserve as well, you know, can make someone sad. But the sadness is also seeing that the fact that he's basically torn between, you know, these two loves as well. It's conversation, conversational, because the person continues to use the pronoun you there to remind us as readers that he's speaking to someone, be it a woman or even another country as well. And then you hear him saying, you know, like your eyes are watching me and you're convicting me and so on. We're able to follow the storyline. And it's also solemn or grave because it's a serum, serious matter. Treason is always a serious matter. And even love and, you know, ideas and themes and so on, such as um, love for one country versus love for another, right? Is there some persons who will, um, first and foremost, it doesn't matter where they are, what they would have done, their country will always come first as well. There are some ideas and examples of wishfulness, which um, tells us that there are some ideas or feeling of regret, full longing, or even yearning. There's still this yearning there for the person to be, for example, um, forgiven by his mother country, right? Not attaching blame, as he said. And also there's example, there's example of the tone being reflective because the person is looking on, right? Even the way in which the poem be, began, he says that it is the constant image of your face framed in my hands as you knelt before my chair. The person is remembering these moments that happened, for example, with the woman as he sat somewhere. And even if I, that the frame in my hands could even mean that the person had a photo of that other country, a photo of, if it as it relates to the poet, he had a photo of, you know, where he lived before he returned to South Africa, all the beauty that they have available there, okay? Now, I am talking from time to time and I'm mentioning the poets about when he lived in England and the US, and these things are not in the poem. However, I am using the poet's life to help or improve our understanding of the poem. And of course, the person is very honest, so I always go back to that last line in stanza one, that my land takes precedence of all my love. And even before that, he said that, but you, you know, you, you know this, you're well aware that, uh, that you can claim no loyalty. I cannot claim loyalty to you and likewise, okay? Because at the beginning, I told you that this is the situation. You are well aware, you knew it, okay? And of course, there's an example of, um, of remorse when he said um, that he, um, he begged, um, he hopes that he will be forgiven. All of this is contradicted when he said that um, it was it in stanza one or stanza two. He says that um, that I confess without remorse or shame. 
the person does seem to be very conflicted. You know, he's not settling on one emotion and one breath. It seems as though he knows uh, what he wants. And another time, he's making excuses as well, confessing. Usually when you're confessed and that confession is contrite, then you can say that it's remorseful. But in some instances, that is not the case. Feel free to add any other attitudes if you can find any more. So these are some examples of the moods in the poem as we read the situation in the poem, feelings of guilt, reflective. Um, could, there's some confusion there, especially the person going back and forth about where who is his dearest love and who takes precedence and so on. We get the idea that this is a serious issue and we pity the persona for the conflict he has found himself in. And of course, there's, you know, statements of feeling sad because of even in the case of the, the other love or even the woman who would have fallen in love with him and the fact that they seem to be an um, unrequited relationship where they, they love him to an extent that his, his love is measured. It is measured and it is limited, right? He already told them at the beginning that at the end of the day, you can't claim any loyalty. I cannot give this to you. So you, you have to keep in mind that this is all the love I can give you. Okay, so just to hear somebody say that to you is very painful, very hurtful. And I guess he knows that or he knew that that's why at the beginning of stanza two, he says, yet I beg mitigation, yet I beg to reduce the pain on the, you know, the sadness and so on. I would have given to you by telling you or putting you in a position where you feel that I can be that loyal to you as well. All right. So here are some themes in the poem. There's the theme conflicts and complications. The person is certainly conflicted because he's torn between his love for his mother country and his love for another country or even a woman, which of the loves that we want to choose. Um, there's an um, example of divided love, which is reflected there in my explanation. The persona's love for his mother country versus his love for a woman or the persona's love for his mother country and his love for another country. And even when we take the life of the poet in consideration, his love for um, England and also the United States because they would have sheltered, fed and protected him while he was exiled from his home country. There's an example of romantic love there, you know, the, the, the obvious literal interpretation of a woman being there, trapped in or being a part of the persona's um, love, in, love conflict. There's an example of um, people and desires, uh, people are involved, the person and the woman, and of course the desire of the, the woman, for example, and even the desire of the person, of first and foremost, for his country to not attach blame, you know, but um, that she will know that really and truly that I wish above everything for her to forgive me. There's also a desire of the woman in the poem who desires the person to give her loyalty as well. And desire can even be seen and it's part of, if we read into the poet's life, the desire of, we can say, the countries that sheltered him, you know, would, would want to believe or to expect that at the end of the day, he will remain with them. He will give them some loyalty and not, you know, run back to your country as if nothing had happened before. There's an example of patriotism as well, right? The person who says that my, my land takes precedence, you know, it reminds me of... Um, the not not necessarily the anthem right but i remember the pledge of st vincent the grenadines land on my boat i pledge to thee my loyalty and devotion i remember reciting that when i was a child but it's something that we all countries of course have their own um pledges and so on but the idea is that patriotism is a, a serious thing very 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 serious that's why sometimes when you join certain military or certain army and so on they tend to keep certain people in certain um ranks so for, for example, if you are in the US Army or even the British Army, if you are not British, British, or you're not born there and so on, there tend not to be, it, it, is, it is a bit hard for you to move out of certain position or certain ranks into like certain high ranking positions, okay? Because the idea is that, that they seem as if there is a, a measure of pat patriotism to some extent, right? And of course, there's an example of treachery there. The person who says from time to time that, He's still, he's still feeling the still fresh trees and all tre treachery that he would have endured as a result of choosing the woman or even the other country over his mother country. And of course, places explore there. There's, there's obvious that the, the first place is the persona's mother country. Okay. And then there's the other place where the person is now with the woman. And if we are thinking about the persona, be, um, love for another country, if we are reading into the poet's life, 
we will think places in this case it's uh, where the poet lived in exile which is the england and the united states and of course there's an example of treachery because the person said that he can still feel my still fresh treason for my country the person who did some criminal offense some 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 crime which caused him to be convicted as a criminal uh, as a result of committing treason Here's a summary of the poem. The persona is torn between his love for his mother country and a woman or another country. The persona blames the woman or the other country for feeling that he is betraying his mother country. So he openly admits his ongoing treason as a victim of a conspiracy between the woman's or the other country's beauty and his own heart. The persona hopes his mother country will forgive him since she is also an expert of loving care. So we have come to the end of another analysis. Thank you for listening and please check out my other videos which should be on the screen any minute now.